Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate you to the next level in your life. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. If you guys want to turn, um, if you want to turn me to the book of Jonah, we're going to, we're going to read a little bit. You guys don't mind if you open up your Bible and read today, right? All right, so we're going to read uh, in the book of Jonah, uh, chapter 3 and verse 10 is where we're going to start. We're going to read Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 and we're going to read it in, in, all the way through chapter 4 verse 10. It says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from the evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to foretell by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out, and he sat down in the place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat in its shade and and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah's head to give him shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant, so it withered. And when the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. And he wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you've been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. You know, most of the things that we worry about, and most of the things that we get upset about, and most of the things that come in our life that, 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 that really get us in a bunch, a lot of times, you know, it's only temporary in the first place. It springs up overnight, and it dies overnight. And he said, And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell the right hand from the left hand, and so many animals? You know, when when we listen to the story of Jonah, we read the story of Jonah, a lot of times we really don't grasp the full concept of what what the prophet was referring to in this book. You know, um, sometimes I've heard preachers preach about Jonah, and they talk about, you know, Jonah ran from God, and you can't run from God, and if you run from God, God is going to come, and he's, you know, he might send something to put you back on track, and it might be a well, but that's great, but it doesn't really give us the complete picture of what the story is about. Sometimes we remember the children's story of Jonah, where, you know, we get the little book with the quarter-inch thick pages, and, you know, you see it, it ends with Jonah being spread out of a well on dry land on a nice sunny day, and he's standing there, and he's got an arrow pointing to Nineveh with a well with a big smile on his face. But that doesn't really paint the full picture of Jonah either. And the ironic thing is, I think it's ironic that preachers, we get to come up and we get to preach about Jonah, about not running from your call, and most of us spent most of our lives running from our call in the first place. I think that's just the most ironic thing. But it's great because the entire story is filled with irony. Um, you know, the thing about Jonah is this. We give, him a, we give him a hard time. We give him a bad rap. But the bottom line is, you know, if you really consider the circumstances, you probably would have run too. In fact, I've run from, uh, I've run from a lot less uh, tasking assignments than the one Jonah ran from. <laughs> Jonah came to God, and God came to Jonah. He said, Jonah, this is your assignment. This is what I want you to do. He said, this is your mission. There was no Mission Impossible music, you know, playing in the background. There was no, there was a dum, 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 dum. That, there wasn't, that wasn't going on. He didn't say, this is your assignment if you choose to accept it. He said, Jonah, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go to this place called Nineveh, and I want you to preach... And, and, and these people in Nineveh, it said they've done great evil, and they've done great wick, wickedness, and it's, and it's come before me, and I want you to go and preach against what they're doing. Now, I want you to think about that. You want me to go where? You want me to say what? I want to tell you a little bit about the people in Nineveh. The people in Nineveh, what was going on at the time? And Nineveh is, a pla- is the capital of a place called Assyria. Now, Israel was an enemy of Assyria. And what would happen is the Assyrians... Uh, they were barbaric people. They'd impale 
their enemies. They, they, they'd, be, they, they'd be head and cut the, the heads off their enemies, and, and they would place them around the city uh, on, on different places around the gates to, to, to make sure that no one would come in and fight them. For torture, they'd skin people alive. And this is where he told Jonah to go. Now, I don't know about you, but that would almost be the equivalent of me going, you know, God coming down and saying, hey, Pastor Anthony, guess, guess what? There's this place. It's, uh, it's a city called Aleppo. Uh, it's in Syria. Now, when you go there, Pastor Anthony, there's going to be some guys there. Uh, they, they, they're ahead of this, this terrorist group called ISIS. And, and I want you to go there, and I want you to tell them that what they're doing is wrong, and they need to repent and turn from their ways. By the way, I know that they've been on the news lately <laughs> for, you know, beheading people and burning Christians alive. But, but, but I want you to take that assignment. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not the first one to raise my hand and say, God, send me, I'll go. And this is the situation that Jonah was in. This is the social circumstance that was happening at, to- at the time in the city of Nineveh. And so um, Jonah did the only logical thing any logical man would do. He went the other way. <laughs> he went the other direction. And the Bible says he went down to Joppa. You know, I once heard a preacher say that anytime you run from God, you go down. And then the Bible says that he went down to Joppa, and then, and then he found a ship heading to Tarshish, and he paid the fare. I once heard a preacher say, you know, anytime you run from God, it'll cost you something. And so he got on the ship, and he went to this place called Tarshish. Now, the interesting thing about this, Tarshish is 2,500 miles away from Joppa. Nineveh was only 500 miles away from Joppa. Do you know sometimes you have to work harder to disobey God than you do to do what God called you to do in the first place? Do you know sometimes it takes, it takes more effort to do, to do the opposite of what God wants you to do than for you to just rest and abide in the thing that he called you to do and go forward and continue to do that thing? And so he ran from God. Sometimes we do that. We say, God, you know, I'd rather work harder in where I am. I'd rather continue to push forward with what I'm doing because what I'm doing is comfortable. And what you've got me doing, God, and the assignment that you gave me may be a little scary or it may be a little uncomfortable. It may involve me stretching myself beyond what I'm capable of. But I want to tell you something, that's where growth goes. That's, where, that's how you grow is by stretching yourself and allowing God to stretch you and pull you beyond the place of comfort. And so that's where Jonah was at this point. And so he was being, he, God was trying to stretch him and push him. And so he got on this boat and he ran and he went the other way. And then the Bible says that God sent a great wind. And the wind came, and all of a sudden this huge storm occurred, right? And so it says that the people were on the ship, all the men on the ship. It says that they start praying, each one to his own God. So they weren't praying to the God. They were praying each one to his own God. While Jonah was on the bottom of the ship sleeping. Now, isn't that ironic? Remember I told you this story is filled with irony. So isn't that ironic? The pagans are praying while the prophet is sleeping. How ironic is that? And you know, and here's the interesting part, is because sometimes I think that sort of paints a description and a picture of what a lot, what, what a lot of times how, how, how we act as Christians today. People all over the world, they may be in the middle of a storm. People may be in the middle of a crisis. There, there may be storms brewing in people's lives right now. But I'm so glad that God built up a church in New Hall, California, that's not a place where people are going to sleep while the storms are brewing in people's lives. God built up a church in New Hall, California that's saying, listen, we're going to pray and point people to the one true God. That's where you guys give yourselves a great big round of applause. I don't know. By the way, I want to say something. I'm... I'm I'm kind of an interactive preacher. I talk to you, you talk to me. Is that cool? Can we do that? We're good? Okay, awesome. You guys are awfully quiet for a Wednesday night. <laughs> and so, and so uh, here he was, the prophet was sleeping. And you know what? It's interesting because people today, they turn to so many different things looking for answers, looking to calm the storm in their life. And so they each pray to their own God. And people sometimes they, they turn to Reiki or uh, you know, new age stuff and whatever the latest internet fad is at the time. They turn to all these things, but they're really just looking for the storm to stop. And so here Jonah was, the prophet. He was sleeping while they were praying. And then they went down underneath the ship. They took Jonah. They woke him up and said, hey, you, get up here. We're all praying to our God. 
why don't you pray to your God and see if he'll stop the storm? And Jonah said to them, he said, you know what? He says, if I pray to my God right now, I serve the God of heaven. I, I'm a Hebrew, and I serve the one true God of heaven. If I pray to my God right now, it's just, a, it, it, you know, it's not going to really do anything because I'm running from him right now. <laughs> and so uh, here they are, you know, again, irony. They're begging the prophet to, play, to pray. And, uh, and then he says, this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to take me. And throw me off the boat. Now, they didn't do that right away. They said, you know what, we're not going to throw this guy off the boat. We throw him off the boat, he's surely going to die and he's going to drown out here in the storm. We're going to keep fighting the storm. So they, the Bible says that they, they continued to fight and weather the storm. But then eventually the storm started to overtake the ship and they realized, hey, we got to get rid of this guy. And I want to tell you something. You know, sometimes the storms in your life isn't necessarily because of something that you've done, but it's because of who you've got on your boat. Sometimes you just got to throw Jonah off your boat. <laughs> and maybe you don't have Jonah on your boat. Maybe you've got Jonah on your cell phone. You can call me on your cell phone. <laughs> Late night when you need some. See, I knew y'all wouldn't save. Look at you. <laughs> so you can download the Elevate Church app, and then you'll be fine. Y'all get to go to heaven. Uh, and so um, I did say y'all, by the way. I have been living in Tennessee for a little bit of time. You guys, you guys are okay with that. I ought to teach you. In the south, we say y'all. So y'all could be, y'all could, by the way, it could mean you, when I say y'all, it could be you as an individual or y'all as in like everyone, just to let you know. It's very confusing. It took a while for me to pick that up. Uh, <laughs> so finally they decide to throw Jonah off the ship. And all of a sudden God sends a whale to come rescue Jonah. Now listen, I don't know how God sent the whale there. I don't know if it was like Finding Dory where God used echolocation. <laughs> but all of a sudden this whale comes along. And he swallows Jonah whole. And I love what the Bible says because the Bible says that God provided a whale. Now, if you're Jonah and you've been swallowed by the whale, I don't know if provided would be the word that you would probably want to use in that situation. I could think of a lot more words that I would rather use to describe me being swallowed by the whale than provided. God, couldn't you provide something else? Carnival, the fun ship. Why a whale? <laughs> and so all of a sudden, Jonah's been, he's been swallowed by this whale. And then, and then, um, and then God, and then what happened is Jonah started to do what any logical man would do. He would com complain. <laughs> he started to complain. He started to talk about his circumstances. And then you know what else? He started to pray. He started to pray, but his prayer wasn't a prayer of, of redemption and forgiveness and, 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 and repentance. His prayer was a lament. He was saying, God, why did you send me here in this place to die? Wait a minute, Jonah, you were thrown in the ocean. Now you're alive. But God, now here I am. I'm in this dark place. I'm surrounded, uh, I'm surrounded by seaweed all over my head. Jonah started to complain. And you know what? It's funny because what happens is a lot of times we start complaining about our circumstance when we don't necessarily see them as provision. Here's what I mean by that. We spend so much time asking God to change our circumstances when a lot of times what we really need to do is to ask God to change our perception of our circumstances. Ask God to change the way we see our circumstances. And that's what's going on in the life of Jonah. He's talking about his circumstance. It's dark. It's smelly. I'm surrounded by digestive fluids and big, huge whale teeth. I'm covered in whale saliva. All because of these terrorists, God, that don't even know you and I don't even like anyway. Jonah starts to complain. He thought he was going to die. Here he is in a dark place and he thought it was the end. He thought it was going to die. But listen, just because you've been placed in a position where you're in a dark place, where you may be in a smelly place, you may be in a place in your life where it doesn't seem like everything's all that favorable. Sometimes we may get into a place like that. And the funny thing about Jonah is he got himself into that situation. He got himself into that place. And sometimes we get ourselves into a place where we say, listen, I don't like the circumstances. I made a mess. Not only did I make a mess, but I made a smelly mess. And now here I am, I'm in a dark place. And not only that, but here this well is, he's traveling. I can just imagine this well that swallowed Jonah traveling deeper and deeper and deeper. And I can just imagine this, he's being dragged deeper into this dark place. 
But I'm here to tell you this, and I don't know about you, but I've made messes in my life that I've had to have God come clean up, and I was the one that made them myself. And I don't know about you, but what, what Jonah didn't realize is even though the well was bringing him deeper, and even though he was in a dark place, and even though it seemed like he was hopeless, and even though it looked like he was going to die, what he didn't realize that even though he was being drugged deeper, God was using this well to still bring him forward to the place that God called him to be. And I don't know who I'm speaking to tonight, but maybe there's somebody in this place that you feel like you're being drugged deeper and deeper in the mess that you've created. But I want to tell you that all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord, and God is still using this vehicle that you're in to propel you forward to the place that he's called you to be. Look at the person next to you say, forward, go forward. This, this, dark place was temporary. God was just using it to propel him forward. And then all of a sudden we picked up the story where God, where this well regurgitates Jonah back up on the dry land. And it wasn't like the children's book. I can't imagine that he stood up there with seashells standing there with a sign pointing to Nineveh. I'm pretty sure that when he was regurgitated on the dry land, he's standing there, hot sunny day in the Middle East, covered in well puke, drying his eyes. First time seeing daylight in three days, probably squinting. But then an interesting thing happened. And that's where we pick up the story. Jonah went and preached an eight-word sermon. He went and preached an eight-word sermon, and it says that, and it says that everyone repented. From the king all the way down to the livestock. And that's where we pick up the story. But to Jonah. This seemed very wrong, and he became angry. Wait, wait a second. You mean Jonah didn't run because he was afraid? Jonah ran because he hated the very enemy that God was sending him to deliver? Jonah ran because, because he, was, he was quick to accept God's mercy when God gave him a plant, when God regurgitated him, when the well regurgitated him on the dry land, he was quick to accept God's mercy, but he was also quick to judge the people of Nineveh. And maybe that's what the story of Jonah is really all about. It's about being able to, it's about sometimes how we tend to, uh, how sometimes we're quick to accept God's mercy and accept God's grace and accept God's love when it comes to us. His mercy endures forever. His grace abounds. But when it comes to others, we look for God's wrath and God's judgment. Maybe that's what the story of Jonah is all about. So Jonah left upset and then he ran and he sat outside the city, the Bible says. He sat outside the city. His anger called him to go outside the very place that God called him to be. When God calls you to a place, we have to be careful not to let our emotions bring us outside the place that God sent us to in the first place. And so he ran outside of the place that God called him to. And the Bible says he sat down. And he sat down, which means that he was in a, in a passive position. And he was upset. And outside of the city, his, his anger was there. And he was angry. And then the Bible says that he built a shelter and sat in the shade. And God provided a plant. And this plant covered Jonah's head. And Jonah was happy. It provided shade that day. And Jonah was happy about the plant. As a matter of fact, I think the Bible said that like three or four times. Jonah was really happy about this plant. He must have really liked it. <laughs> and so here he is. He's sitting underneath this plant. And just when he got comfortable, I love what the Bible says next. It says, God provided a worm. Now, wait a second. I thought God just provided me the comfort. Why would he provide something that would take the comfort away? Remember what I told you before. We don't grow in the areas that we're comfortable. When we want to grow, we have to grow in the place that God's stretching us outside of our comfort zone. And sometimes just when we get comfortable, just when I drop the kids off to school, I get a phone call to come pick one of them up. Just when I got caught up on the bills, all of a sudden now this, this, the car breaks down. All of a sudden, just when I started to get comfortable, something happens that pulls you out of your comfort zone. That's what this worm was. This worm was pulling him out of his comfort zone. God provided the worm. And then... 
I want to talk about comfort for a second. I was reading a story once about a man who wanted a pet shark. Now, that sounds awfully cool. I myself would love a pet shark. <laughs> but he went to New York. He was in New York. He went to a pet store that sold exotic pets. And they had these sharks there, and they were in these different shark tanks. Not shark tank like a TV show, but like an actual shark tank. And uh, they had these sharks swimming around, and, and he started asking questions because he really wanted the sharks. He started asking questions about the water they use, the tanks, and, and things like that. But then he asked an interesting question. He says, hey, um, how big do these things get? Because I live in New York, and, you know, the apartments in New York are only about this big. So how big is this shark really going to get? And, say, and it's amazing because the pet store owner told him something that was profound. She said, well, sharks only grow to the size that they feel comfortable in their tank. So if you want a small shark, keep them in a small tank. If you want a big shark, put them in a bigger tank because they're only going to grow to the place where they feel comfortable. If you want a shark to be able to become full grown like Jaws, throw them in the ocean. <laughs> but isn't that funny how people are the same way? We only grow to the area that we feel comfortable in and our circle of influence. Stepping outside of your comfort zone is the sure way to let God grow you as a person in your marriage, in the ministry that God called you to. And this is the situation that Jonah was in. God provided a worm. You know, many years ago when I was an investment banker, I had a friend of mine who was a client, and, and um, it was a stressful job, really stressful job being an investment banker. Maybe not as stressful as pastoring, uh, <laughs> but it was, it was a stressful job. <laughs> but every night, he would go out and he'd frequent the bars frequently. And uh, he'd take his clients to the bars. The bars was like his thing. That's what he would do. He'd leave work and he'd go to the bar and he'd take his clients and he'd meet them there and they'd talk about socks. I don't know about you. I may not feel that comfortable investing my money with someone that's sitting there having a couple shots, but uh, that's what he did. And he was successful. One day, usual routine, got in his car, started to drive after leaving, the car, after leaving the bar. And all of a sudden, the lights started going off in the back. Woo! He pulls over. Cop comes up, license and registration, please. Hands it to him. He comes back. He arrests the man. He takes him to jail. And he gives him a DUI. And he couldn't drive anymore, which I really felt sorry for him because he had a really nice Porsche. <laughs> but that was his thing of comfort. He loved his car. His marriage was falling apart. His kids hated him. But boy, did he love his car. That was his comfort zone. Interesting thing happened. His wife, who had been going to church, started to pray for him. And then she started to pray, and she started to pray for her husband, which is what a godly wife should do. She was praying for her husband, and then all of a sudden, this happens. And if you were to ask him at the time, he'd say, this is the worst thing in the world. I wish I were dead, kind of like Jonah. But there's a different story. Because what happened was he started taking the bus. And as he was taking the bus, instead of going to the bar, he'd get on the bus and go home. He actually started going home to his family. On the way home, he'd sit and he'd call and he'd talk to his wife. And he'd start talking to his family. He'd talk to his kids. And all of a sudden, his marriage started becoming strengthened. His kids started to love him again. And next thing you know, he started going to church with his family. He gave his life to Christ. And now he's on the bus witnessing the people, telling them about the goodness of Jesus. If you asked him then, he would have said God taking this car away was the worst thing that could have ever happened to him. Or, or him being allowed to have his car taken away from him. I'm not going to say God took it away. But, but him being allowed to, to have his car taken away from him was the worst thing that could ever happen to him. If you ask him today, he'll say, God provided a worm. But Jonah didn't see it that way at the time. And God said, Jonah, you've been concerned about this plant that you didn't tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. And he said, if you care about something so small, how much more can I care about my people? And that's when I realized the real story of Jonah. The real story of Jonah is how sometimes we want mercy for ourselves and desperate for others. You know, it reminds me of the farmer in the field that came home one day. 
and all of a sudden he realized that there was this big party happening at his house. And he, he, this party's going on, and music's playing, and he walks up and he goes, what's going on here? And they've got, and they've got a big feast and the barbecue going. He says, what's happening? And he says, hey, your brother's home. Come on inside and join the party. And he's like, a party for him? The guy that went to a beachfront town and, and where, where there's a tavern on every corner and spent all of his money on prostitutes and, and, and loose living? No, thanks. Maybe that's what the story of Jonah is really about. But what if that person's your enemy? You know, I'll never forget when I was in Afghanistan for my first time. I was the 50 cal gunner, 50 caliber machine gunner. What that means is I was the guy that sat on top of the turret of the truck. You see the big truck coming by and there's a big machine gun sitting on top. Well, I was there and, and I was on this machine gun. And as we're traveling down the road, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, we start passing this cornfield. And here it is late at night. The truck and the convoy's moving past this cornfield. And out of nowhere, someone fires a rocket-propelled grenade straight for our truck. And this rocket that's coming directly toward our truck, straight at me, just in an instant, I looked up and I just, I just yelled the name Jesus. I didn't know what else to say. I just said, Jesus. And just when I said that, this rocket that's traveling straight toward our truck, all of a sudden, it just deflects and goes straight up into the air like this. And I looked up and I... And it was only about 10 feet away before it, it, it went up in the air. And it's funny because my commander always says, he says, you know, I think maybe the fin of the RPG hit a low-hanging branch or something and it deflected it. I said, no, that's not what happened. I know what happened. It was a heavenly angel standing there with a God-given Louisville slugger and he got that thing out of the way. He hit a home run that night. But right when that happened, I'm standing there on my gun and I turn the gun toward the cornfield. And all of a sudden I see this man standing there with an expended RPG in his hand. And I lock on him, and I say to the truck commander, I said, I've got the target in sight. And then all of a sudden, right before the truck commander could say, engage the target, the Afghan interpreter sitting next to me tapped me on the leg. And he said, who is this Jesus that you're talking about? So my choice was this. I engage the target and destroy the enemy or I share the gospel with this Afghan man that's sitting next to me. And as I'm standing there, palms sweaty, my fingers on the butterfly trigger, all of a sudden this man in the field threw his hands up in the air and he surrendered. Our team ran out and they started to arrest the man. And, and I reached in the, my breast pocket and I pulled out a small New Testament Bible that had been given to me by the Gideons. And I gave it to the Afghan man, and I started sharing the gospel with him right there. The story doesn't end there. Every day, this Afghan man would come up to me, and he'd ask me questions, and he asked me questions about the genealogy of Christ. He asked me questions about salvation. He'd ask me questions about what it means to follow the Lord. And then next thing you know, I look up, and this Afghanistan man, this Afghan interpreter, at night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, would sit there, and he'd read the Bible underneath the guard tower to other Afghan soldiers. First it was two or three Afghan soldiers sitting there listening to him read the Bible. Before you know it, there was a dozen Afghan men. And there, there, before you know it, there was a couple dozen Afghan soldiers sitting there listening to him read the gospel in a country where it's illegal to own a Bible. I wish that was the end of the story. But you see, I had a hardened heart. I hated my enemy. It's easy to hate somebody that's shooting at you every single day. And it's easy to get callous when you've been in over 200 firefights and you've lost, you know, dozens of friends. It's easy to be callous. And what happened in that moment when I had to make that choice, when I had to make that decision? That Afghan man bought me more hope than I bought him. But isn't that what Jesus did for us? 
I can imagine Jonah having a conversation with Jesus going, hey, Jesus, but you don't understand. I had to leave a place that I loved, a place that I was comfortable, a place where I was a prophet, and a place where people worshipped me. And I had to go down to a place where people hated me and people were my enemy. And I can imagine Jesus going, you know what, Jonah, I know a lot about that. Believe me, I had to leave the heavens, the heavenly glory seated at the right hand of the Father and come down to a place where the Bible says that we were once enemies of God, yet he still gave his life. I can imagine Jonah going, but, but, but Lord, you don't understand. I was, I was locked in the deep, dark place with no hope to get out, and I was stuck there for three days. But you see, Jesus' story didn't end in him being in the tomb for three days because he got up, he rose, he rose from the dead, and he came back to give you freedom and victory. And that's showing grace and mercy to your enemies. That Afghan Turk, they call them Turks, <laughs> that Afghan interpreter, I was leaving Afghanistan my last day there, I was excited. I was going home. I'm standing there. The sun is starting to peak up over the Afghan mountains, and I'm standing there in the helicopter landing zone waiting for our Black Hawk to come in so my squad and I can get on this plane and get out of this country for the last time. And I'm standing there waiting. And all of a sudden, that Afghan interpreter, he started to run toward across the helicopter landing zone. He started to run toward us, and he's running and he's running. And by that time, we were on a first-name basis. I called him Joseph. He called me Bruce. That was the name, the American name he chose was Joseph. And he's running toward me, and he says, Bruce, Bruce, I've got one more question for you before you go. Of course, I thought he was coming to say, hey, thank you for telling me the gospel and, you know, being selfish like that. But, but no, he said, i got one more question. And his question was this. He said, Bruce, I understand why Christians in America are so in support of the war, but what I don't understand is can you tell me why you Christians in America don't send people down here to tell all of these people that never heard the name of Jesus? Why don't you send anybody here to let these men know? And I answered him the best way I knew how. I looked at him and said, Joseph, you don't understand, man. If we sent missionaries here in this country, it would be a death sentence. And he held up this little tattered Bible because now it was tattered, the one that I gave him. You know, almost a year ago, he, he held it up and he shook it in my face. And he says, he says, Bruce, these men, these men were willing to die for what they believed in. And then he placed his hand on my shoulder and a tear ran down my eye. And he says, Bruce, he says, do me a favor. When you go back to America, tell the people there to love their enemy. And then the Holy Spirit hit me because the Holy Spirit asked me, he says, Bruce, do you love your enemy enough that you're willing to die for them? And my answer was, no, Lord, I'm not. And then he said to me, but, but that's how much I love you. Because you were once an enemy of God. But he showed me grace and mercy. And so my question to you tonight is this. Is where is your Nineveh? Where is the place that God called you to, do, to go? Where is the place of unforgiveness in your heart? Maybe your Nineveh isn't preaching the gospel to, 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 your, to, to, a, to an enemy overseas. Maybe your enema is forgiving your ex-husband or, or, or showing mercy to an ex-wife. Maybe your enema is, be, I mean, your, your, your Nineveh, <laughs> I have to watch that there. <laughs> I just feel a heavenly anointing that God's trying to loose something in the spirit. <laughs> maybe, maybe you're Nineveh. <laughs> How do you come back from that? I don't know. But maybe you're Nineveh. Maybe the Nineveh, the place that God called you to, is as forgiving people in your life that don't deserve it. Maybe it's forgiving the person that sold drugs to a family member. Maybe it's the Republicans or the Democrats. question is this, where's your Nineveh? And will you go? If today's message impacted you in any way and you would like to help us spread the gospel to others by giving a financial gift, please text the number below. 
and we know that someone's life will be changed as yours was today.